where do you see AI working in the healthcare space and, and especially health tech? And, and what do you think in terms of the most immediate opportunities for SMBs in that space? Okay, I'll go to the far end of that rainbow where I say where I think this ultimately will go in something that's been talked a lot about, which is precision medicine, which I'm sure you've heard. It's, been, it's not a new term. But what the utilization of these tools will allow you to do is to drill down to individual needs and individual care plans and individual responses to my specific need, because mine is different from yours, is different from my kids. So you'll actually be able to realize that because it's going to be able to take the fire hose of data that you create on a daily basis and actually be able to craft um, solutions or not. You may be perfectly healthy, but craft interactions and craft your plan based on your specific responses, on your specific uh, results on how you are on a health-wise basis. Right now, it's still, um, here's generally what the rules are. And if good providers know you, they could tailor it because they kind of know who you are. But with AI, it actually be able to drill down to specifically because the providers are already at the stage. You can't deal with all the data coming in. You know, like to give you an idea, what is it, 2023, if I might be wrong, maybe 2022, there was... 3,000 exabytes of health data created around the world. Now, I don't know if you, you're familiar with how large exabyte was. I wasn't until I heard. Basically, it's a billion trillion. And it's increasing at 35 to 40% a year. And that's because of all the data that we have, high image resolution, you know, things off our watch, off of all the various devices. So we cannot humanly manage all that as any individual. So that's where the what they're calling AI, basically it's just number crunching. So these great number crunching solutions can help bring into that whole idea of precision medicine. To your question, Becky, on the second part of the question, which is what can SMBs do today? Really, it's, it's understanding the guardrails and understanding the problem of the algorithms that are being created and the biases within those. And okay, how do we deal with within the guardrails? How do we deal with that fire hose of data? How do we provide unique perspective for the individuals? Understanding at the end, you need that human element. Again, to the, the commentary about you know, technology enables, humanity heals. All these things are enablers. So AI agents that we're very much involved in in healthcare provide the provider, the clinician with all the data and insight and analysis based on their rules for them to be able to go to the next step and say, okay, this is what we need to do. It's quite exciting where that can take us. Oh, it's, it's, it's really exciting, but quite honestly, also very scary because it's so, it's a very thin rail that it's on really easy to fall off because of AI agents or um, technologies or chat GPT that you have, you know, the hallucination. So you get results that are just hallucinated results and you have, how do you, how do you know whether it's a true result or not? Definitely good points. There was a podcast I saw with Dr. K, who hosts a very popular um, Healthy Gamer podcast. Uh, he's, I believe, a um, he has his degree in psychology, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, he was talking about like the recommended daily uh, allowances for for different uh, minerals and vitamins and stuff like that that we take. As a consumer, you kind of see it. You trust that a government organization or some higher authority has done the required research to ensure that you'll be healthy. But he was saying that's all based on averages. Yeah. Um, and so it's already suboptimal, like yes. built in. Like maybe it's it's better than nothing on average. But what would it mean if everyone had hyper personalized? healthcare. It's exactly what you need, exactly what you need, Howard, exactly what you need, Becky. We don't know what that would look like. It could be an exponential improvement for our species, no? Well, absolutely. Using your example, to be just a, a bottle of Advil. It sort of says, you know, if you're an adult, so if you're over 12 years old, if you're under 12, no more than one. If you're over 12, no more than two every four hours, every eight hours, whatever the case may be. I'm not a big guy, but I'm, you know, 6'1", about 200 odd pounds. My daughter, you know, is 5'5", five, five, and, you know, 120 pounds, we have the same guidance on the, taking our Advil. To your point going, yeah, there's, there's there's room for, there's wiggle room in there. And so to that point, the more precision oriented you can get where you go, well, this is actually what you need. And based on your metabolism, based on all so many factors, because there's so many other elements to taking medication that become really important. You obviously know better than I, but I'm curious, 
also what I've discovered in business and life, the knock-on effects. Like often we're looking to make decision A and B, but what if decision C and D and E and F and all of that were all optimized, all hyper-personalized? Like what, what kind of path would that take us on? It's, it's not always just a matter of going through one of two doors. It's, it's like going through infinite hallways of mirrors that one is optimized and one is a law of averages. Yeah, it's, it's an infinite tea, tree diagram is kind of where it just expands out exponentially. And so that's why we're, you know, everyone started talking about all these things. We are so early days <laughs> on all of this. You know, we've, we've not even started up the curve when it comes to utilization of all these tools. You know, we're just still in what we're calling the AI stage, which is very, which is machine language and machine learning. It hasn't really gone anywhere. Generative AI is really the real generative AI, which is where it's actually doing some quote unquote thinking. We're not even really there yet as opposed to number crunching. So to the point where we're getting that massive expanse of we're still a fair way away of truly doing that. And so it's quite honestly, it's, it's, you know, where can it go? It almost becomes incomprehensible in terms of all those various routes it can go and the ramifications of it, because all we, we, all we know is what we know and we don't know what we don't know. So to your right. point is you got to start running all the algorithms to say, okay, what are the implications of this or this? Is basically yeah. everybody having their own weather computer program that the National Weather Service uses to calculate, you know, the weather patterns, which is looking at all the permutations and combinations and saying what's most likely. Like we're still in the averaging business. There's an interesting, I don't know, like it seems like a logical fallacy kind of that I that I observe anyway in my life. I guess I'll speak for myself, where you want something you can't get and you expect that you'll achieve it by doing what you already know. So like kind of going back to what you said, you don't know what you don't know. I remember, I think it was uh, Gary Kasparov, the the chess champion. I, I forgot his, his name exactly. Apologies. It's Gary, no, Gary Kasparov. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, and, and then um, the Go champion, I think a year or two after him, they were uh, developing these AI computers to beat the, the best humans at um, these games, chess and Go, because they were seen as good benchmarks for complexity and the right amount of logic and creativity, et cetera. And they, the, the humans kind of held their own for a while. Yeah, that was um, until they didn't. And then once they didn't, it was like a mercury switch where it's just like, boom, like humans don't stand a chance. And what, as I understand it, well, a couple of things I think are interesting. The time compression, like the computer in a year was playing more matches than all of humanity could in all of humanity's time. And the other thing was it was teaching itself. So it was making moves that the engineers couldn't understand. And they said it was like watching an alien intelligence. And I, when you mentioned we don't know what, what it'll look like, I think, I think it's very true. In order to cure cancer, in order to fly or you know expand in the cosmos or whatever it is that we're trying to do, we, if we can't do it yet, there's a high likelihood it's not going to look like what we expect or we can't really expect what it'll look like. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, absolutely. It's, yeah, we, we certainly can't really know what the future will look like, you know, the certain parameters of time. But to your comment on the computer, what was interesting in terms of those, those programs is, yes, they're doing things and they weren't, you know, they were learning not in the, you know, I guess in the traditional sense where they realized the learning was, if I do this, I seem to be winning more than I will not. So it starts incorporating that. So it's, again, it's using, it's a logic and throwing stuff at the wall as opposed to, oh, I'm going to come up with a brand new hyper way of doing it. It's just, all it is throwing numbers and saying nine times out of 10, this works better. I'm going to use this. But what's happened with now that, which is really interesting, particularly with the Go, and actually it's chess as well. The humans playing them have said, oh, I've not seen that move before. So the humans are doing the actual learning from the computers. And as a result, I think we're now starting to see humans are actually becoming a bit more of a match again for the computers because the humans have been learning from the computers, but the computers can only do what they've been taught, where the humans have the capacity to go beyond that. 